Hello everybody and welcome to a new episode of Revit Pure Live. I am your host, Nicolas Quetelier, an architect, BIM specialist and founder of the website RevitPure.com. The role of the goal of Revit, Revit Pure Live is to help you become a better Revit user. And today we have a great expert with us. But before introducing her, a few things to talk about. Uh, First, for those who don't know, I'm going to uh, talk about Revit Pure Pamphlets, which is a collection of guides on some of Revit's most confusing topics, including coordinate system, line weight finishes, sculpt boxes, uh, shared site, doors, railings. Uh, you can get all these guides for free if you go at revitpure.com slash pamphlets. You should also be able to find the link in the video description. Um, on Revit Pure, you'll also find our premium learning packages, including the basics learning package, as well as the design learning package. And you can also have a look at our popular blog, um, which explores some of Revit most confusing topics with always with the goal of making them simple for you. Um, Next week, our guest will be Dana De Filippi, also known as Dynamo, who has her own show online on YouTube about uh, Dynamo. Uh, she will be joining us to talk about the Dynamo player. So that should be helpful and a lot of fun. All right, so before we get moving, I always like to ask people in the chat where you are from. So uh, already some people mentioned it. Uh, Los Angeles, Tampa, Florida, Copenhagen, England, Washington, Long Island, Ottawa, uh, uh, Laval, Quebec, Vancouver. So you can keep writing where you're from. Always interesting to see uh, where people are all watching from. All right. Uh, so today's guest is Lauren Schmidt. Lauren is a landscape architect who graduated from Ball State University in Indiana, Indiana and currently based in Seattle. She has been a landscape architect and designer since 2011 before starting her new role as a design technology specialist at Parallax Team. You may know her as the founder and author of the great blog LenArchBIM.com. She created this blog as a resource and catalyst for the use of BIM in landscape architecture focused on workflows, methods, and content for landscape in Revit. Lauren has also built her own Dynamo package called Landform and is currently working on a new landscape plugin for Revit called Foreground. So welcome to the show, Lauren. Hi. Well, thanks for accepting the invitation. Um, I'm really excited about the show and I think uh, everybody, there's yeah, a lot of interest for this one. 131 people right now. Uh, yeah, I get a lot of questions about sites in, in Revit. People have problems with uh, topo surface. Pro people have problems with building pads, uh, creating curbs, roads. It's a, a big challenge. I know Autodesk created like the site designer a while back and they, they've killed it. So it, it seems like it's it's always a, a big challenge to create, create site components. So... Um, my question for you to get started is why did you decide to create your, your blog, Len Archbin? Um, yeah, I guess I created it as someone, as a landscape architect who was trying to figure out how to use Revit and I went online and it was just like, <laughs> there was nothing there. <laughs> and so once I started learning a little bit, I was like, this was, this was back in 2014, maybe when blogs were a little bit bigger. <laughs> Not as uh, maybe like podcasts are now, but uh, uh, so yeah. I once I started learning it, I was like, well, I might as well post what I learn, so that other people don't have to try to reinvent the wheel. Essentially, um, yeah. So that's where it started from. Yeah, and. So has it, has it been in your practice? Did you always use Revit to do a landscape architecture or were you kind of the, the, the Revit, how you call it, the Revit unicorn where, wherever you work? <laughs> no. So yeah, I wasn't 
the Revit Unicorn when I started. Mm -hmm. So I, I started out at an architecture firm in Indianapolis after I graduated. And that was architecture and engineering. So they had almost everything mm -hmm. in-house. So they had architecture, they had MEP, they had interiors, they had a small civil site landscape group. Um, so everyone else at that point was in Revit, including like interiors. I think interiors had just kind of transitioned into Revit. And they had been, architecture side had been using it for like five or six years at that point. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of interest to, to get sort of the site group into Revit also. And it seemed like a good fit for me. Um, and so I, I kind of learned from the architects as I went and kind of helped the kind of get them going in, into Revit. Just and I, I, I think they're I think they're still using Revit <laughs> today. Yeah. So All that's right. good. <laughs> with, with with the landscape, you mean? Yeah, because yeah. I think, well, I don't know. I would have to ask you, but I think the Revit doesn't have the best reputation when it comes to landscape and sites. Is that right? Was that what you you've heard in the area? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have a lot of a lot of tools that are super intuitive for landscape architects out of the box. Mm -hmm. um, which is why I have found a lot of resources in Dynamo and now why we're building at Parallax, we're building a, a custom tool specifically for landscape architects, which is kind of built on those Dynamo workflows, but more robust and just buttons that you can press on the ribbon. But yeah, it hasn't been without its challenges. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's something that we have new clients coming to us all the time, landscape architects who are trying to figure out yeah, how to do it and it does seem like there are landscape architecture firms who have successfully transitioned um, they tend to be larger firms with more resources mm, yeah, yeah but there are there are firms out there who are doing it um, but the transition is can be can be tough all right so a few people in the chat mentioned your sound was a little low i've adjusted it on my end so let me know if it works or if you have any problem, but it, it should be better now. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you've moved on to uh, solely among the years. That's what you, you've told me. You, you move from just you Revit, using Revit out of the box, then to using Dynamo, and then you're using C Sharp to build your own plugin. I think we'll get to that, but uh, it would be interesting. I will switch to your so we can see your screen. Yeah, there you go. We can now see your screen and maybe we can start with uh, some of the basic stuff. So do you have uh, do you have any, any idea what to get started? I, I would say what is a few tips to, to get started that uh, you think could save people a lot of time when it comes to uh, landscaping um, and Revit. I mean, I think a lot of the tips are very are similar to the architecture side, mm -hmm. um, but but it's a little different with the landscape application. Um, one, so like. I think you, you can't approach Revit with like a lot of a lot of designers have experience with like AutoCAD mm -hmm. um, and like SketchUp, for example. And you can't you can't necessarily approach Revit with those same expectations. You have to have you have to have completely different expectations as far as what it's going to do and how it's going to do it. Um, so I think it's very similar in that regard. Mm -hmm. I think with landscape, you have to have like even lower <laughs> expectations because some of the workflows yeah, yeah. can be can be tough. Um, so I think it's it's often having um, the right mentality at a firm. So you you need to like you need leadership buy in, and you need you need staff who's going to be willing to learn, um, willing and like yeah, yeah, to learn. power users. Yeah, exactly. Um, even if they don't know Revit right off the bat, that, I mean, like, there's always certain people who who are a little more interested and seem more attuned to, to doing that sort of stuff. Um, so having people like that is is really key, I think. Yeah, yeah, sure. To making it successful. Um, yeah. So we can see your, your your screen now. So do you have anything to get started, or do you want me to? Um, yeah, I just brought this up. So this is a model right. that we did at Parallax the end of last year. Um, and it's actually just a model we did. We did a VR model for a client, um, but it's just a site that I've boxed out the building. So it's just a mass. 
Um, but it's an example kind of of, of, a, of a pretty detailed site um, mm -hmm. and, how, and how you can model that. And so I can just kind of show what that model looks like. Oh, my toggle is going to come up. <laughs> um, and a lot of it is modeled with floors, shape edited floors, mm -hmm. um, model curbs as railings, and then yeah, using using planting and a lot of components that you would kind of expect, like like light fixtures and site components themselves are tend to be kind of more what you expect. You always like it you can find some people are always concerned about the lack of landscape content when you're like transitioning over into Revit, but I think it that's the same as like an architectural mm -hmm. side of things is that you always have to manage content and but like depending on the firm you might build your own content and content is always an issue I think regardless of discipline. Um like Revit ships with some out of the box like architecture content. But I, I know a lot the of best. firms I know a lot of firms <laughs> don't even use that. So I think yeah. that's like a common misconception that people who aren't experienced with Revit can think that mm -hmm. initially they can think like the content is an issue that content is an issue for everyone um yes yeah. so i guess one of the first question is uh what is your stance on using topo surface and or using floors when it comes to site elements like roads or sidewalks so it seems you, you seem to be using floors what, what is that something you would recommend over creating topo surface with uh uh, the split regions well, I'll call it again <laughs> yeah so I can explain that a little yeah, bit yeah, more yeah. Detail. so there is a topo service in this model it's like a large it's kind of a, a big contextual element um you, and it's used essentially as like a ground plane um in this model and the floors and that's used it's kind of used as like the softscape ground plane and all of the hardscape and the paving is modeled with floors um and that's for a few reasons like a topo surface is a mesh element which means it has no thickness and so it's not useful for documentation or even like modeling when you want like stuff that looks better and like yeah so it doesn't have a thickness and if you like you can do a subregion and you can apply different materials but subregions can't touch <laughs> so, mm -hmm. like, yeah it's always not, a mess right yeah, yeah. I, I never use subregions anymore just because oh, okay. it's, like, it's there. I mean, it's it can be kind of an easy, quick workaround for architects, I think, sometimes, just for, like, visualization, if you, like, want to show something in the background. And I understand that, but for, like, any sort of real modeling, I never <laughs> use subregions anymore just because... Like, so what would you use a topo surface tool for, then? Yeah, like I said, so we use the topo surface as kind of like your base softscape. Um, uh -huh. okay. There are even instances like your own structure. And if you have like a landscape or softscape on structure, I've modeled those with floors also in the past um, because you're cutting, if you're cutting a section through a building and the architect always is like, they don't want any topo surfaces on top of their buildings because like you can't control what that does and it will mm -hmm. like go all the way through. Um, so I guess in a, in a flat site, for example, would you not use uh, any topo surface at all? Is it is it more simple than to use all floors? It can be. So, mm -hmm. um, I so I worked at GGN up until end of last year, and that's like we frequently we had um, like urban sites. We didn't really use topo surfaces at all. Like we would use topo surfaces as like a base. Um, to like model the existing site, mm -hmm. but then there, we would eventually just discard that topo surface and everything would be modeled from floors. So you can see this is a, this is the Washington State Convention Center, which is a project here in Seattle. It's currently under construction. Yeah, that seems like a cool project. Yeah, but you can see it's, it's like all, all floors, like even, even the planting areas are, are different types of floors. And now you can see up on the roof, roof terrace, we have all the softscape is modeled um, with floors, and you can see the guts of this model a little bit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that's a really cool green roof. Yeah, I mean, because you can't a topo surface is not practical uh -huh. for documentation. 
really. Um, and once you're on structure, it's not useful. So, so I see a bunch of topo lines on, on the roof. How did you create that if it's not? So these are actually, this is, these are model lines. Model lines, okay. Um, it's, a, it's a group of model lines. Um, yep. And so when yeah, would, that's like the one advantage to using a topo surface is that it has contour lines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but you can't control those contour lines because of the way triangulation works in a topo mesh. Mm -hmm. um, like you can, topography is the way it's set up in Revit is that it, it has points and you can you can change those points, but how it connects those contour lines, like you can't control that at all. Mm -hmm. And so even using those contour lines for documentation, it's usually not something I would advise. Um, if you have a really flat site, it might be fine. <laughs> Yeah. But you can also get really weird results on flat sites um, with like contour lines, like doing really weird zigzags. If it's like, if, that's, if it doesn't have a lot. Yeah, of it's time. now that you mention it, so that the, the lines are quite weird sometimes, especially uh, around the edges. You might have a bunch mm. of weird lines. I think I saw one of your posts about that, how to clean that up. But yeah, it, it, there are workarounds mm -hmm. and like understanding how a topo surface triangulates can help you, but it can also just be like. A time sink for like no reason um so in general like i try to avoid using topography as anything but like the base like a visualization kind of mm -hmm. base host yeah. um yeah all right so uh having a look at the questions already a lot of action in the chat <laughs> <laughs> i would need them Almost a moderator. So people from Germany, Detroit, Vienna, Austria, Queens, Tennessee, Belgrade, Serbia. Okay, okay, I'll scroll down a little bit. Um, already question. What, uh, you can give topo a thickness. So there was, yeah, you mentioned that there's no thickness in topo surface. Yeah, there isn't. No true mm -hmm. thickness. I mean, you can go into your site settings and tell it like... <laughs> like this goofy thing where my site setting yeah so you can go into your site settings and uh and like tell it yeah what the base of that poche is but that's not like an actual thickness <laughs> um, yeah yeah it's just telling it graphically where that stops um and like in and depending on like, like if it, in a linked model you could get different results i think depending on site settings like your architect is gonna not necessarily see that results the same way mm -hmm. um so C yeah, question yeah sorry a question about the, the building pad yeah i've always had troubles and with some of the clients they always complain about building pads what are your opinions on that i guess if you don't use that much topo surface you don't need them right <laughs> yeah i mean on certain sites yeah you still have topo surfaces are still useful and you still have building pads sometimes but yeah in general i do try to avoid using them um like if you have like a really steep site sometimes it's a little bit unavoidable because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the building pad is useful and that it will just like push a topo down yeah, sure. and be flat um but yeah you can get in my experience you can get really weird results if you're like trying to use them up against like a subregion like if a subregion mm -hmm. because uh, a building pad creates its subregion, um, like from it, like it generates its own subregion, and then you can get weird results when it because they can't touch, and then also like building pads can't can't overlap either, and so oh yeah, just have, like, a, a the lot moment you move something, you get start to get a lot of uh, overlapping <laughs> lines and uh, that kind of uh, errors that you don't know how to fix. Uh, Scour DX asks uh, floor versus roof. Uh, would you use roof over floor? I noticed in Revit 2018, Autodesk added floor error message when they overlap. It is annoying and tends to slow the model down. Yeah, that does happen. Um, and yeah, that's something in our foreground app we, we currently support. So we're currently looking at floors and roofs because some mm -hmm. people do like to use roofs. Um, in 2022, there's some new floor APIs that are not going to be supported that aren't currently supported in roofs mm -hmm. um, like the, the new sketch boundary yeah yeah API. i saw that yeah 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 Yeah, and so that leaves us wondering if it's even worth supporting roofs um 
But essentially, the difference between floors and roofs is that, like, roofs, you have to, like, offset. You have to, like, account for the offset thickness mm -hmm. up, which is just, like, an extra step that you have to manually manage unless you're somehow managing that with Dynamo or an app. Um, so I, I generally just don't use, I, yeah. The errors are annoying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree. Um, but there uh, are other benefits to using floors, especially in 22 now. Yeah, I, th I think I saw one of your posts on your blog about floors versus roof, if I remember correctly. So I, I might add that link in the description. Uh, so CG says, there's a dynamo graph to use topple surfaces as references to uh, draw floors from. I, I don't know about it. Yeah, I mean, you can do all sorts of stuff between floors and topos and roofs mm -hmm. and dynamo. Uh, yeah, which is how yeah I got started editing and automating. Um, yeah, so like this. So yeah, this 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 floor here was generated with Dynamo because like I can't imagine ever trying to do that manually. Oops. Yeah, so it basically oh, wow. okay. it's generated using those contour lines and like doing an interval. So that's oh wow, that's so that's a floor. Yes, it's one big floor. Um, you could do it separately, but there are advantages to having it all together. For, uh, in, in what Dynamo script did you use for it? Is that something that people can download? Yeah, so I have a number of posts about this. Okay. It's making essentially, it's it's making it's pretty basic Dynamo. Mm -hmm. you basically, you can make a topo surface from the lines, and then you can just put all the points from that topo surface into the floor. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, it can get more complicated depending on like what exactly method, what method you're trying to use. Um, but yeah, that's also something that we're doing with foreground. So here, how about I'll, I'll switch over to foreground. So this is my little sample model here. Um, yeah, and that's one of kind of our basic tools that we're starting with is the ability yeah, to drape a slab onto a topo surface. Um, uh, so. Just wait before you get on to, uh, um, to, to quickly on, on foreground. So it's uh, with Parax team, you're developing this plugin, but it's not yet available, right? It's not yet available to the public. Mm -hmm. um, we have started some beta testing. So it's hopefully a couple months out from public release, but we're we started with kind of our hardscape tools, and then uh, right now planting tools are in development. So yeah. Okay, and so this, it's to automate the creation of such thing like creating fl uh, sh floors with shape and uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right? So this is the this is the ribbon okay. here. Um, so it's it's basically the goal is to automate any sort of landscape or site related workflow that you would want to do in Revit. Um, so yeah, we have a whole set of floor editing, floor slab. It also currently works on roofs um, as well. And then yeah, these planting tools are still in development. And there's we have a few topography tools um, that can help you kind of get started, or depending on, or you can edit topography also in ways that you can't out of the box. Uh, but yeah, you, I think you, what. Just sorry, saying, so, sorry to ahead. interrupt. There's a, yeah. a few uh, people that mentioned that your volume is low. I put it on maximum on my hand. I don't know if you can slightly boost your microphone. Uh, is that better? It's I much can, better. I can try to talk louder. <laughs> no, that's great. Closer to your, to okay. your mouth like that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Thanks. Great. Uh, I, I'll let you go. <laughs> um, yeah. So what? There, yeah. So a common you can do this in Dynamo. Um, Depending on how you're trying to do it, your your graph could be more or less really simple. Um, one of the really simple ways you can do it is just if you make a subregion, you make a floor that's like the same outline as the subregion. You can do it that way. Um, it's kind of a very imprecise method because subregions, like the way they generate their points, can be really weird if you have like any curves in them. Um, so with our tool, we're allowing you basically pick a slab and then it grabs a topography for you. You can change it. And that has a couple different like calculation methods. So this is my preferred method. Um, 
but I could run it with just boundary points, and so it will just do kind of like the bare minimum to shape edit the floor. This one is get, gonna get it at the intersecting contours. So it's gonna get it at every point. It's gonna add points wherever the contour intersects the, the slab. And then you can also get all of the interior topography points if you want. Um, and then, you, or you could run it at an interval, which I'm not going to use. Um, and then the nice thing about like this method in particular this is particularly useful for like sidewalks and roads where where you want to have like those contour points pulled in to your topo surface because um, that's makes it more easy to manually edit later on so yeah so now that that floor is sitting essentially right on top of that topography surface that's really cool and so how would you uh, model uh, curves and sidewalks would you use uh, floors as well yeah yeah so that you can see i have that kind of roughed out in here uh so you can run the same thing oh that's cool. through right mm -hmm. now um yeah and then one one thing that i i still use sometimes it's still useful is um one of the workarounds is sometimes with the sidewalks you can create sort of like this framework and you use like floor openings um so this floor is actually just like this big rectangle here um and then it has these different openings that and this is useful this is particularly useful for like a sidewalk where you have like mm -hmm. planter strips or if you have like tree pits mm -hmm. um it can be useful because then you're only controlling these endpoints and if you ever have to manually like go back and edit, edit that you're only having to mess with like four points as opposed to like, yeah 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 example down here where you have like yeah i think uh yeah ten. that's the kind of thing i've wasted a lot of time modeling topple surface and you would have to <laughs> model each little point whenever there was an intersection like that so that's yeah a cool and so idea. that can still be useful mm -hmm. like the downside there is like it's a little bit more complicated and you have to like keep track of the larger floor boundary and and the opening boundary but depending on um and that's something i've used even in like this model where we had like all these little like tapered edges of like a paver that we were showing um and so i modeled those with like an opening so that i didn't have to like try to mess with those points if i ever needed to come back and like adjust the grading which i had to do a few times um so it's still it could still be a useful framework, even if depending on what, how you're doing things, even if you're using Dynamo or if you're automating floors um, and points, it's still useful. All right, <clears throat> and so I'm curious. I'm looking at, at, at that side. So let's say you wanted to implement a, a building in that. How would you proceed? Would you delete part of the topo surface, or would you use a, a building pad? What would be your strategy? Uh, I mean, I think it would depend a little bit on the project, like, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, on this site, it might, yeah, maybe I would use a building pad initially. Yeah, since it's and, a, there's a big slope. Yeah, if, yeah, depending on the slope, you could, you could use a building pad, um, and then initially, and yeah, and it, depending on, like, yeah, how much softscape there is on this, like, block in the end like if this was like eventually like all building i might mm -hmm. just like get rid of that topo surface eventually and then it wouldn't that would be like a moot point and then you would just like end up putting little bits of like floors in as soil instead uh so it depends on the project and the context i think largely how you want to approach it if you if you still want to have like a big contextual topo surface um you can also like split a topo surface so you could like split it out of the floor but that mm -hmm. has different drawbacks uh, yeah but if you split it isn't it a permanent can you bring it back you can okay. um but like you would have to you could like merge it yeah because like topo surfaces can be split and merge back together mm -hmm. um but yeah like when, whenever you split a topo surface, you'll get like you get points along that split line. And so those are just points that you have to manage later. 
So. All right. So, so I, pro the, I probably wouldn't recommend splitting a turbo service. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like it when people do it. So the chat is a little crazy. I'm trying to keep up with, with the questions. <laughs> uh, thoughts on uh, shape floors and pattern distortions. Yeah, so that's something that it's a common thing that we have to deal with. Um, but yeah, my I you see a couple different methods that people use. You either see people use like filled regions. Um, and they just don't have patterns on and they use field regions. My, what I prefer to use is I prefer to have essentially two sets of floors and I'll have like a flat floor that shows the pattern correctly. And then I have the shape edited one, which you still have to manage boundaries. If one changes and the other doesn't, you would still have to do that with a field region also. Mm -hmm. um, uh -oh. But I find using a model element is just generally better because then you'll see it in all your views you don't necessarily have to manage a detail group which you could do it through a detail group but then you also have to manage all like the filled regions and so if, if you're using the same floor you don't have to like make a new filled region you just have that floor and whenever that floor changes it will change uh so that's that's how i've yeah so, so for, for some people who don't know what we're talking about is if you have a floor with a shape and you have a pattern like a square pattern for example that the squares will become all the form if you uh, depending on yeah the, on so the you can see that here mm -hmm. on this yeah and the sidewalk um where this is the sidewalk pattern and so on the flat floor it shows up correctly and the 3d floor yeah you get stuff like that and that's there's only so much you can really do about that and so um, can, can you show a, can you show me in, in the floor plan what it looks like yes let's see let me go to the painting plan yeah and so that's something that we've actually it might be something uh, and I think it's on the Revit roadmap as far as something that Autodesk might be mm -hmm. trying to address. Um, but there's only so much you can do. So yeah, so we have this flat floor. That yeah, and you that and you didn't mention. So this is an additional floor that you model on top of the the, the sloping. Yeah, it's it's a flat floor. I tend to keep them at sea level, um, so that they're not like up in the 3D model. So like if you're cutting through, you don't see it and get confused. Okay, so wait, so, so they are below the other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it presents some funny challenges sometimes with visibility uh -huh. and like making sure you're like looking through things correctly. Um, but essentially, you just turn off the 3D floor and then you'll see that flat floor. Below. Oh, I see. And so you're using view, view filters, I guess, to uh, remove. Yeah, the, I mean, there's the different ways floors. you can do it. Um, work sets or view filters. Either way. Uh... All right. Looking at the questions, some people say uh, that's amazing, Lauren. Uh, <laughs> Dexon, yeah, I agree. And Dexon says, are you excited for 3D topple coming soon? I'm not sure what he's talking about. Is that on the Rivet roadmap? Uh, 3D topo. I mean, topo is already 3D. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to, So Dexon, you can clarify what you mean. Uh, Jonathan says, very smart. Mark Wessel says, is cut openings part of your product or part of Revit already? So cut no, opening, it's yeah. the out-of-the-box tool, I guess? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I just use vertical openings on the architecture ribbon. Um, so if I go back to this one, yeah, and I edit that. It's just, yeah. Openings are strange that they like their names changed mm -hmm. <laughs> depending on where they are, but it's a floor opening. Um, yeah, and it's it's here on the uh, yeah vertical opening. I guess it depends on its host. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the other question, what uh, what is the best way to measure cut and fi fill in surveying? So so Revit Topo does that out of the box to a certain extent. Uh, which um, what, what does that? So here I can. I, yeah. Let's okay. See I can okay. Do, let's see how quick, quickly I can do this on sure, the fly. Sure. Sure. Um, so you have to. Yeah. There's a lot of different, a lot of different steps, but you can do it. I think more quickly with a graded region. So if you do a graded region. Uh, yeah. And I do a graded region. That's great. Um, 
this is my new phase one turbo surface. And then what I can do here, I should use foreground. Let's see. You go to plan view. And I'm going to modify this area. I'm just going to bring up some points really quick. So it does it out of the box that you can do cut fill with topo surface. So I'm going to just really quickly oh, got too many lines there. So I'm going to just bring like, these points up by 10 feet. And so you can see that, yeah. So now I have a graded, I have two topo surfaces. And then I believe if you just go to, I haven't done this in ages, um, but if you have a topo surface schedule, um, and if you do, depending on the phasing, if you're showing like show demo and new, oh, it's not going to do it. See, I think I need to find new one. Let's face created. Uh, I need to do I need to tell it that this is an existing topo surface. I don't remember how it works. Oh yeah, oh, that's previous and demo. But you can start to see, and if you do, you can do cut fill out of the box. Um, I don't remember. I have a blog post on it. Yeah, oh, okay. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> tell me the blog post and we'll refer to it. Yeah, but there is a blog post that kind mm -hmm. of walks you through how you can do, you can do cut fill out of the box. Oh, I think mm -hmm. it's trying to do it, but this is all fill. And so it's not working. Um, you can see it's starting to turn red, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, but you can, you can do some cut fill out of the box with topography. You're still limited by the, the topography tools that come in Revit. Um, but yeah, you can see, and you can schedule this, mm -hmm. um, but you can see there's no cut. But there's this is the fill. Yeah, some people based. mentioned some information on the chat. So anyway, I think we should jump on to the next topic. Daxon specified what he meant with the 3D topo. He says 3D topo coming soon on Revit roadmap. Topo will be not mesh, rather solid. Many possibilities. So I haven't looked at that. So that in, that's interesting. So I think we should talk about planting soon. Before that, uh, maybe a last question about that. Any ideas on how you might create a tunnel in a Revit landscape? <laughs> Everyone always likes to ask the tunnel question. I feel like that's more of like a structural yeah, yeah. <laughs> civil yeah. question than a landscape question. But yeah, it's the same it's the same issue if you're doing like a landscape on structure. You can't use you can't use topo surface. You have to use floor or roof. Um, it does seem like the Revit team is working on yeah, making topo surface into a solid or however, whichever way they're going to do it um, so that eventually you'll be able to, to cut a topo surface. Out. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, there's cool. currently, there's not, you can either like have a linked topo that like sits on top and that's like a weird thing mm -hmm. or yeah, you can do it with floors or roofs. Yeah. Yeah. That seems like the, the best option using floors or roofs. Um, do you always use uh, linked models for sites? Uh, I guess th does that question mean like uh, the site was always in a separate Exactly, file? yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just like mm -hmm. any discipline, the site, like, yeah, I mean, you, can, I you can have a consolidated like file with everyone working together, but like, I'm not sure who that yeah, benefits. <laughs> that's also the workflow I would recommend, but I still see a lot of sites integrated with the buildings. And yeah, I mean, it's I not think recommended like to create your own, a different site. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, that's that's definitely a challenge like, mm -hmm. for landscape architects who are working with architects who are used to not having a landscape mm -hmm. architect in Revit. And so that architect is used to like modeling some of their landscape that's adjacent to the building because they want to see it. Um, and so it's always a learning process of like teaching your architect 
and like telling them like don't do that like don't model that that's my scope i'll model it mm -hmm. Um, but that, that certainly always happens that, yeah, architects like to get out and start modeling the landscape. Yeah. All right. So I think we should talk, uh, about planting. Um, I think along the years I've consulted a lot of your posts about that, especially about the special features of planting because planting is, is it the only uh, category of families that scale? Like keeping the proportions? I think planting and maybe planting is the only one. Mm -hmm. But yes, planting is special and that, yeah, it scales. Um, there's some like magic that's built into a planting family that mm -hmm. lets it scale uh, when you change the height parameter. Uh, so it, it, it which is useful, but it also creates a lot of challenges when mm -hmm. building a planting family. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something at Parallax. Yeah, we're building our building out our planting library. Yes, and it's it's a it's something yes. that the, we the can default work trees the default trees are are not very good, right? So I would be curious, what do you do in, with your custom uh, planting families? What are some of the steps you would take to make the default tree family better? Yeah, so this is. The start of like one of our shrub types here um yeah so it's, it's this is one of the older ones so it doesn't have it all in there but yeah you can nest like a plant symbol you can have like a 3d model symbol that's that are different so you can control the plan separately from the 3d model and then one of the other things that we do with all of our planting families is you can have the height be controlled by an instance parameter. Um, that's challenging to implement with the like scaling properties of planting families, but it is doable um, so that you can like basically kind of randomize your heights within a range uh, of like these trees. If I go back to my 3D view, yeah, I have these, these trees here and these are the same, these are the same type, but they're, they're two different heights. Mm -hmm. So that I can can change this guy to 20 feet, uh, and then he'll scale accordingly. Um, yeah, and that's that's kind of what we're hoping to plug that into our app, so that yeah, that was my next question: is is yeah. there a way people can get their end on these families? Yeah, I mean we're so we're building them out at Parallax, and you can purchase them from mm -hmm. us <laughs> okay. directly. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of architectural content libraries too. So planting is like our first landscape content library that we're building out. Um, and yeah, the landscape architects are definitely very interested in in that because yeah, planting is kind of like a crazy beast because mm -hmm. there's like hundreds of thousands of different plant varieties and types. And so it quickly becomes like this crazy asset management game. Yeah. And <laughs> what I see is that you've added some, some sort of a base. Uh, to yeah. The... So these also have like a root ball. Um, so yeah, this is our, this is a newer version of the tree oh, family. Uh, can you move the, the window just to the left? We, we, because we can see our, our faces with the cameras. Oh, okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, can you see yeah, it like yet? This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Yeah, so you can see, yeah, there's the plant symbol as an elevation symbol, as a root ball. So these are built to, to ANSI, which I think is an American standard. Um, so you can like change the root ball size. So this is like a number 20 container. You can change it to like a ball and burlap, like six inch caliber size. Um, and then it's gonna change, is a nested Family. Oh, okay. So, and we can see the base has changed. So, is that something you you would see on uh, on sections? I guess it's mostly for section views. Yeah, it's for section views, and it's and it's also for coordination. Um, so that's often that's like a big coordination issue for landscape on structure, is that you're always negotiating with the structural engineer like how much soil depth you have, mm -hmm. and the soil depth really does matter if you're like sticking a tree up there. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause you need a certain, you need a certain size for the root ball at a minimum, but then you also want a certain size for like the hole that that root ball will grow into, which is larger <laughs> than the root ball. Mm -hmm. And so like, it's always an educational process, uh, making sure that everyone understands that, yeah, a tree can't grow in a foot of soil. 
Shocker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a shocker. Yeah. So somebody asks if you can show the the, the plants in the plant view. I, I think you you showed them a couple of minutes. But I saw that you have a few visibility parameters for branches and stuff like that. So can you show us how that works? Uh, yeah, that's the elevation symbol that is still in progress. Um, oh, okay, that's in progress. Yeah, and I'm not sure if I have a, but essentially it might have an elevation. Uh, yeah, one second. Let's see. Let's see if we can see him in this. Oh, no, it's not. They're not showing up. There might be. No, I think I think I have them disabled. Mm -hmm. well, those parameters are there, but they're not enabled. Um, but you did ask at the beginning, like one of my tips, and I, one of my tips for for new big, like beginners, like landscape architects that are just kind of starting out in Revit, is is to always kind of try to work in a 3D view, or at least like work side by side. This is that's that's one of the things that is really hard. Like landscape architects coming from AutoCAD, like you're used to just like working in plan, and like that's all you how you ever look at the documentation is always in plan. Um, and you could get some really weird <laughs> results in a model if you're not looking at the 3D model. Mm -hmm. and so I always encourage, yeah, new users to, as an as a more experienced user, I can more easily work in just a 3D view, but at least have them open kind of side by side. Like yeah, yeah. This is is a good and, way to like. And so if you open the, the family, I, I build some families like that, but the 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 plan the symbol in in the plan view is a nested. A planting family inside the main planting family, yes. right? Yep, that's correct. So then, in theory, you can change the it's appearance. Similar. I don't have uh -huh. very many. This isn't a very good example, but I have. Oh, yeah, that didn't do anything. <laughs> this is an older family, um, mm -hmm. but then you can just, you, in theory, if that was built correctly, um, you would, yeah, you'd just be able to change out. The appearance like that you can see yeah i think this one is these shrubs that has been pulled through um a little, a little bit better so you can start to see yeah, if i change that to that one it will yeah just change the plant symbol yeah cool so uh a few questions uh not sure how it's pronounced that Zaba, I guess, asks, how do you model ground covers in perennial beds? Yeah, so that kind of dovetails with what we're doing for foreground. Um, so my past workflows have included using like either rooms or areas to do kind of planting areas. You can see I have a, a couple, these are rooms, I think, in this view, yeah. Um, and the nice thing about using rooms or areas, they're very similar, um, is that you can kind of like, you can drag the boundaries around and the room or area will just kind of like resize as long as it doesn't, as long as you don't like pull it out of its boundaries. Um, and that I prefer that over like, you, you find that some firms will use floors, but the disadvantage there is you have to go in and like edit each, you have to go in and do a sketch edit and then come back out. And if they have share boundaries, you have to do each of those by themselves. Um, so I found that this is a lot faster. And then what we're doing actually with foreground is we're building out the ability so that you can place plants individually because one of the downsides to using like rooms or areas is there's, there's nothing there in 3D for you to visualize. Um, so we're building out the ability to like make a plant mix. Um, so I'll just go ahead and create a new one here on the fly. So you can add it by drop down. I'm just gonna add it by picking a couple types. And I'm just gonna do 60-40 and then save it and then, oops, that's a gas mix. I'm gonna rename that and update that. And then I can use it in my placement tools that appears here, and then I can select an area, and then it starts to generate those points before I run it. Um, and then 
I can I can like give it a wiggle if I want it to to kind of like randomize like this placement of it a little bit more. Um, but I'll just go ahead and run it. And you can see it places mm, all cool. of those. Yeah, that was uh, that was a, a question from someone. So you, it's a good timing. Uh, Jose asked, how can you randomize amount of trees of vegetations to achieve different heights or rotations? Though so that's pretty much what you did. Could you give it yeah, a, a rotation? Yeah, you can, you can do it with Dynamo. I, I mm -hmm. have a couple of posts, I think, that mm -hmm. show how you can like generate a forest. I yeah, guess. but it's uh, out of your uh, own package, right? Uh, with your own Yeah, host. I have a couple of nodes in Landform that can help you do that. Can you show um, that? Do you have the Dynamo not too far from you? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so this is very similar uh, okay, to okay. that workflow. I mean, I could try. I don't have it. <laughs> on the ready, mm -hmm. um, but it's very similar in that uh, the difference in the Dynamo script is it doesn't like do a regular spacing. It just like does like random points within an area. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's a bit more like scattered than this. This is more like for a planting plan. Um, All right, well, uh, I can also give links to your uh... Uh, the, uh, dynamo content it's yeah but if people are interested yeah in doing dynamo stuff yeah landform is is my package uh that has a couple has, it's, it's has called nodes. uh how is it called it's, again it's landform. called landform. landform landform yeah so it has right. nodes for for kind of placement uh and yeah and like setting percentages of mm -hmm. like placing plant planting instances also has some newer nodes for like editing topo surfaces um but from what i understand your current uh, this plugin is meant to replace is the yeah, evolution of your dynamo nodes it, yeah it is the evolution and the and yeah i mean dynamo is very accessible to a lot of people but like mm. the average user doesn't find dynamo very accessible yeah they don't care yeah, I mean, even when I was at GGN for four years, like I would get into Dynamo if I had some like really heavy lifting to do, mm -hmm. but not just like not in the day to day because it's just hard. It's hard to like keep up to date on the packages and all that stuff. Um, and so, yeah, what we're and the other thing is like Dynamo does it is kind of like a little slow and it can be a little buggy mm -hmm. um, sometimes. And so what we're doing with this tool set is making it much more stable and faster. Like see the difference between Dynamo and C sharp, especially when you're doing like a containment, like which is basically placing points in an area. Uh, it's so much faster in C sharp. Yeah. Like you saw mm -hmm. it just like generate the points in a second. Whereas like if I did this same thing in Dynamo, I'd have to sit here for a couple of minutes while I thought about just like making those points before it placed them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think ep episode number, I don't, I don't remember which one it was, but I had uh, Michael Kilkelly from Arch Smarter, and he came on to teach the, the, the basic stuff about creating your own uh, script using C Sharp. So for mm -hmm. those interested, you can have a look at that. And yeah, one of the things he was telling me is uh, how much faster it was. So he says it's, 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 yeah, it's like the path you had. You start with Dynamo, but eventually if you want to get farther, farther and farther, uh, getting to C sharp is is a good way to do it, uh, but but from your, your script using uh, Landform, is there any kind of ready and made script that people could could use the Dynamo player, for example? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you go on my blog, there's I have a number of different mm -hmm. okay. a lot of old Dynamo posts that a lot of them are still very applicable. Like some of the nodes may have changed a little bit, but a lot of the functionality is still there. And Dynamo even has absorbed some of those like sh floor editing nodes are like they ship with Dynamo now, but mm -hmm. they didn't used to years ago. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's a lot of what I did with Dynamo is a lot of, a lot of floor editing and a lot of yeah, some planting placement. I mean, where this becomes challenging with Dynamo to manage is like the updating aspect of it. Um, so that's something that we're trying to build in. And that's like something that like Dynamo just can't really, you can't like do really complicated things with Dynamo. It's much easier to do kind of like a one-off. The updating process is a bit more cumbersome. 
because w- w- with your plugin you can update this yeah okay i'm there there yeah, it's it's still in progress so the, the hosting is you'll see these are going to disappear because the hosting does not work <laughs> <laughs> yet um so they're like down there they're not hosted they didn't rehost correctly but the idea is that uh yeah we'll be able to update and track and kind of keep track of all that stuff for you mm-hmm. and all right. And can you show in in the section view the 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 planting box of trees? I'll be curious. I think I saw that in your blog. I thought was, that was pretty cool because we see it a little bit in the the 3D view. Oh, like this this guy? Yeah, or the the wait. planting. Can you show it in the section? I thought that was yeah. It. Sure. Let's see here. Let's draw a section. It's not there. <laughs> I wonder what kind I made. Section two. Is that the one I just did? Oh yeah, there it is. Oof. Let's see here. Got some weird uh, view templates on this view that are visual complete. I think part of it is because I have a couple of topo surfaces. Mm-hmm. overlapping now yeah but there yeah at least we we get the idea that you can yeah uh you do see yeah. the, the the planting box yep yeah and they can have materials to cut that you can see mm-hmm. currently but yeah this is a pretty rough rough idea of what it would look like All right, so we're getting close to four. I don't want to take too much of your time. I think something I was interested in, let, let me look at my notes. It was a parking, the way you uh, created a parking using uh, nested shared families. Can you, could you show that? <laughs> I, I actually don't. <laughs> that you is don't? a very old family. That's that an old, okay. That I do not have up that I can show. Um, but... Yeah, <laughs> I don't think a lot of my projects have not had parking in mm-hmm. recent history. Mm-hmm. Um, this Haven't one done parking a while. Yeah, this one that we modeled last year it does have parking. Um, doesn't use any smart components for that parking. It actually, we were just going for like the visualization aspect. Um, mm-hmm. So these are actually just like railings. Oh, okay, that, railings that we're using as paving striping. Mm-hmm. Um, so what you're talking about, with, yeah, that that parking component is like, it has to be like on a flat surface or it has to be on like a, it'd have to be like on a ramp in like a parking garage where it was like mm-hmm. a constant same slope. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're looking at kind of integrating those two things together so that you could have like a nested, you could have like a smart planting or smart parking family. And then we could attach this like visual, visualized kind of railing so that these could like place automatically Uh, because the yeah the downside and what you see sometimes like you see crazy workarounds with like subregions like people like sketching out tiny little like stripes for subregions so that they follow topography Mm -hmm. Um, the nice thing about railings is that if they're straight segments they will actually follow topography or a shape Mm -hmm. edited floor nicely you can get if it's curved, you might get some funny results, but um, but sometimes you just want to see it. But having it schedule is is a nice feature too. Um, yeah, so. what 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 I like, I, I think. Yeah, can can you bring up your uh, browser and show the blog post so at least people know what uh, I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, it, me... Yeah, what I liked about it is you could schedule the number of parking in a row, for example, which is often what the clients like. And which oh I, yeah oh my gosh which, this is so funny so this one's actually is Aaron who is who's my who I work with at Parallax uh-huh. um, yeah but this, so this is I I had completely forgotten that this existed but yeah this is like showing that his parking family is mm-hmm. yeah is this nested family and I, I have do I have my own blog post too on it. 
it's just funny yeah ah, there so this is my blog post version of it uh yeah that, that's this one yeah i what i liked was the 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 tag that showed the the parking on each row mm -hmm. yeah it's i mean this is a very basic version mm -hmm. i think the parallax ones are probably more robust um but yeah he has his and this is the content the library that we sell at parallax but it's yeah it's a debate and he, he can like change the angle i mean aaron aaron goes like all out with his families um they're and they're impressive so it, it's the really nice thing yeah and and what i'm posting about here too is that it's this linear family mm -hmm. so you can just like drag it and then it resizes based off of that um, this is like a very basic version of the of the same thing, basically. All right. Well, I'll give the the link to that for those interested in creating, uh, uh, creating a tag to show the number of parking in their family. And uh, yeah, that, that, that was uh, pretty cool. So again, a lot of actions on the chat. Uh, Parallax is on the chat. Says hi. And okay, we've talked about that. Uh, Team Parallax says. Yeah, I think it was about the section to showing the, the tree, the, the, the planting base. It says it's the building section view template. It has everything uh, <laughs> po uh, poche. Sorry, that's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm in this old, this, this sample file is built around uh, the architectural template because we're still building out our landscape template. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Um, it still has the poche, but it lets you see it. <laughs> that's kind of my own fault too but this is more just a, a 3d demo file <laughs> all right so looking at the chat for final questions we're going to wrap this up soon so if you have final questions uh, go ahead on the chat else the, the show is coming to an end soon um score dx asks do you have tools that can take all individual railings and host them on topo with one click so, you, so yeah you can do that with dynamo um i actually added when i added a couple nodes a few months ago i added one that lets that's a rehosting node that will rehost the railing that you put in to a host of your choice um so you, yeah with, with using a couple it I think I forget. I think it was a wombat node. You can. There's a blog post I have about it that you can easily create a railing and then rehost it with Dynamo. All right. So your your Dynamo package package is still ongoing. You're still creating nodes. Uh yeah. I haven't. I've been really focused on foreground recently. Yeah, yeah. So I, I haven't. Um, but yeah, I plan to continue kind of updating and probably adding some of the features that we're getting into foreground um, in different pieces into landform. Mm -hmm. um, but they'll just be kind of little pieces. It, it's hard to you can't really replicate a whole suite of packages, a whole suite of tools mm -hmm. in Dynamo. You can get like some of the functionality, but not all of it um all right so yeah somebody earlier asked i think you mentioned it uh when was the, the the plugin going to be released you mentioned a couple of months something like that yeah we don't have a definite date yet just because mm -hmm. development is still ongoing but you can you can go to parallaxteam.com and yeah we have uh a foreground it was a it's sort of a foreground page and you can put your name in to sign up on to get updates so we're still we're still assembling our sort of like mailing list to get updates out to people mm -hmm. it's a whole like endeavor to figure that part out too but we're, yeah yeah we're i think that. i think i've signed up i haven't uh, received anything though <laughs> yeah we don't have a, a, a mailing <laughs> there's nothing nothing quite there yet so that's on okay. my to-do list <laughs> all right but yeah we will be keeping people informed of when it's available um yeah if you follow parallax team on twitter that's a good way to keep or myself uh we also post updates and sort of sneak peeks on there frequently uh mark wessels ask will the landscape template be available for sale too yes 
so you can get in touch with us now about the if and if you're interested in yeah and any of our content or our templates uh, some of that stuff is still in development um but we're working with clients to to have like the first version ready to... all right so i'll Maybe a last question uh, from Ryan Hask. Retaining walls, I usually place the top and bottom uh, wall topo elevations at equal points along the wall. Is there a better way to do this? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, uh, you, I usually place the top and bottom wall topo elevations at equal points along the wall. Is there a better way to do this? Oh, uh, yeah. I think I understand what he's saying. Um, so yeah if if you have like a vertical change in the topography at like a retaining wall yeah that can be difficult uh to manage because of the way because you can't control topography triangulation um mm -hmm. so my tip that i usually tell people is if, if you're trying to make topography do something um turn on the triangulation because then you can see what it's doing and that it makes it easier. This is how I, I've kind of self-taught myself how to control triangulation. So if I go into the surface, um, you can see where it triangulates and you can't, you can't tell it how to do that, but by seeing it, it, it helps you understand it. Um, and you can see like, it's making this funny little jog here because it's just interpolating between these two points. And so if I, if I want to control that, I can try to add a point there. Yeah. And so now it's, yeah, it's usually involves adding more points, but it's, it's usually also like you want your points to be like evenly spaced apart and like, yeah, it's weird. And there's not a lot you can do about it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully topography gets better, but in the meantime, yeah, having that triangulation on, is useful to understand what it's trying to do. Otherwise, you can drive yourself even crazier. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty smart. I think I've never really used that triangulation tool. But maybe a last question because I think it's 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 a good one. Uh, how do you present spot elevation on plan views with flat floors? So because uh, so, in, in, in the plan you you hid the the slope yeah, floors. Yeah. So I don't. Uh, so. The flat floors I, I only have on then the materials plans typically um, and I only have the flat floors on in a plan where I want to see that pattern and mm -hmm. most other like plan views like in a grading plan view I only have the 3d floor on with the spot elevations and you would so, remove the the surface the, the surface pattern yes okay. typically grading plans do not have surface patterns yeah, yeah sure. um, so yeah you have to yeah you might have to change your standards a little bit if, mm -hmm. depending on if you're used to having hatch patterns on and grading plans but yeah all right so i'm looking at the list i think okay we've talked about that we've talked about that yeah i think we've covered a lot um you have a course right on revit landscaping can you show it <laughs> uh yes the course is kind of old at this point mm -hmm. um but it still exists. It's it's very much like an an introductory course to for people who are have kind of zero experience using Revit and want to learn kind of like modeling basics. Um, so, and I think it it's taught and it might be taught in either twenty fifteen or twenty seventeen. I don't remember, but it was, it was that's that's when it was made. So a lot of it is still applicable because a lot of the modeling strategies haven't changed, but it is very much like a kind of a basics. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like, we don't get, it doesn't get into a lot of like documentation and like the heavy yeah. lifting. Yeah. But I think, you know, even though we all get excited with Dynamo and scripts, a lot of people are still at the beginning, especially maybe in the landscaping realm. So I'm sure it can be interesting for some people. So I'll add the link to, uh, the course or actually it's pretty uh easy to find on your le website then archbim.com so yep. anything else you want you want to mention or, or talk about um yeah i mean so i, I guess I, just at parallax yep. we we kind of do i'm working on kind of our full landscape implementation side of things so we also do training and 
content and kind of everything mm -hmm. um that's much more focused for like firms wanting to kind of onboard and learn so that's that's a big part of what we do but yeah also building out foreground so stay tuned yeah i'm pretty excited about that plugin it seems <laughs> seems like something i would definitely use all right so just a second having a final glance at the chat yeah i think we've covered uh, most questions and a lot of viewers i think it might be my my record show so far so <laughs> a, a lot of interest yeah we reached a peak of uh, 180 people wow earlier so a lot of interest uh, super interesting stuff. So I'll try to uh, post all the links uh, with to all Dynamo scripts, to the plugin, to the blog post we might have uh, referred to. Um, so and any final words, tips, or advice? Else, I think we can get going. Yeah, I mean, some people will try to tell you that. Yeah, like modeling landscapes is impossible in Revit. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I would say it's not impossible. It's not necessarily easy, mm -hmm. um, but we're trying to make it easier at Parallax, so. All right, well, th thanks for the effort and thanks for your great blog. I've been reading it uh, along the years. So thanks to Warren. And next week, um, we're live with Dana De Filippi, also known as Dynamo, who has her own uh, live show on, on YouTube. We'd be talking about mastering the Dynamo player. So uh, don't miss the show. So thanks, Lauren. And thanks for coming to the show. And thanks, thanks to everybody on the chat. Yeah, thank you. Uh, see you next week. I think, yeah, I think it's at 8 p.m. though. So next week, next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern time. So goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>